Thank you everybody for joining us today for the GB Inside Genetic Medicine webinar series. Today we're thrilled to have Dr. Michael Davidson give us a presentation titled Personalized Lipidology, How to Utilize Genomic Testing to, di to Diagnose and Better Manage Lipid Disorders. Um, first, uh, some quick housekeeping. Um, if you have any questions, enter it into the, into the Q&A field on the bottom. Um, and Dr. Davidson will answer questions at the end of his presentation. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and a copy of it will be available on the GV Insight webinar series page in a few days. And um, one final announcement. Um, so join us for our upcoming webinar with Dr. Christy Ballantyne, Professor of Medicine and Human Genetics at Baylor College of Medicine. We'll be discussing the potential role of expanded genetic testing in the evaluation of patients with severe hypertriglyceridemia. And that's on Tuesday, June 14th at the same time. Um, so registration for that is on our website too. Um, so for today's presentation, Dr. Davidson, um, he's, uh, he's just a quick introduction. Um, Dr. Davidson is the Director of Preventative Cardiology at the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. He's the past president of the National Lipid Association. Um, Dr. Davidson has authored hundreds of peer-reviewed articles and textbooks on cardiometabolic disease biology and prevention. Um, he's been involved in early clin clinical trials, testing efficacy of lipid-lowering drugs such as statins and omega-3 um, marine-based oils, um, and is still involved in the development of newer therapeutics. So I'm going to pass it on, Dr. Davidson. Thanks for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thanks, everybody. I'm excited to uh, present to you today. As Mendel said, we will have questions at the end of my 10 case overview. I want to thank Mendel and GB Health Watch for really pa partnering with us and determining how we can best use genomics to better manage patients with lipid disorders. Let me begin with a kind of a famous figure about how different genes are, affect lipid metabolism. Uh, there are hundreds of genes involved in, 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 in lipid level, determining lipid levels and lipid metabolism. And any number of one of these uh, gene polymorphisms or mutations can lead to clinical manifestations of, of lipid disorders. So I want to um, go through with you a series of cases that highlight how these different mutations or polymorphisms, uh, uh, some that are well established, some that are quite unusual, can lead to how we can better manage patients uh, for reducing uh, risk of pancreatitis or cardiovascular risk. Let me start with the lipo lipoprotein lipase pathway. So what I'm showing you here is, is a, uh, a liver, and uh, we're showing a uh, tube of blood that has uh, chylomicrons in it. And so as we look at how we, as, as we, after we, uh, a high-fat meal, we metabolize the, uh, the chylomicrons and VLDL, and we, we use LPL to hydrolyze the triglycerides along with two cofactors, APOC2 and, and APOA5. And that ultimately leads to clearance of these triglycerides into free fatty acids and ultimately you know, clear by the liver. So this is, this is a uh, well-established you know, pathway for how we handle dietary and uh, other forms of triglycerides in, in our bodies. So let me start with my first case. So this was a... Um, 45 year old male with a strong family history of premature atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, also with non, non alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD, elevated liver enzymes. He was um, put on Wagovi for weight loss and did, it was quite effective. He lost 20 pounds. And we started him on a uh, low dose for suvastatin and, and a low carb diet to manage his, you can see, very high total cholesterol 301, HDL 35 triglycerides, 200, uh, over 200, 290. And so this was his lipid profile. And so then we went on and did genomic testing and we found that he was uh, a compound heterozygote you know, for two APOA5 SNVs, a single nucleotide variant, and, uh, and also an APOB uh, variant. And so uh, I just wanna focus on the APOA5 in particular and how that um, is a very important uh, variant that leads to not only high triglycerides and low HDL, but, but high cardiovascular risk. 
So here's the uh, the data on the APOA5 variants. I'm just giving you one specific variant here that, that when you have the variant, you have higher um, levels of triglycerides, lower levels of HDL. LDL, at least in this, with this particular variant, is relatively unchanged. And you have high, but you have higher levels of APOB and lower levels of APOA1. So this is important because when you add up all these different variants, you get more and more elevated triglycerides, lower HDL, uh, and and, um, and 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 what's most important is that you get higher ApoB levels and higher cardiovascular risk. About each ApoA5 variant that you have, they accumulate. Each one has about 22 milligram per deciliter increase in triglycerides, uh, and and that um, ultimately uh, can impact a patient like this. So here's the important aspect of it: is that as you look at the triglyceride raising effects of these different variants, you, that's associated with increased cardiovascular events. And this is a, you know, one of the genetic factors that link you know, both high triglycerides and, and premature cardiovascular disease. So I just wanna point out uh, from, again, from this, this, these studies that these patients also have you know, larger VLDL particles, smaller LDL particles, and in, in lower uh, HDL particle size and concentrations. So here we added um, evolocumab uh, to this patient because uh, he did have a very high cardiovascular risk. And um, you can see that he, he responded modestly to a statin, but when we add the evolocumab, we got a, a much better response. Now we're continuing to monitor him, but the message here is that the, 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 the compound heterozygote to APOA5 it gave him a very severe form of combined dyslipidemia, both high LDL, uh, high LDL particles, high APOB, and low HDL, you know, driving increased cardiovascular risk. So we want to be aggressive with him uh, as, a, as a overall patient population type of patient characteristics that, that make him someone you want to be uh, specially in tune for. I want to just go over um, our, our own experience with, with APOA5. Uh, variants. Uh, we've done, we published this paper recently with our fellows, uh, Priya Polapate and, and my lipid nurse coordinator, Molly Horan, and, and, and Mendel as well as one of our co-authors. And we find that APOI5 variants are relatively common uh, in a lipid clinic setting. Uh, and what's, again, the message here is that this, this is a uh, uh, genotype that leads to a phenotype, which confers, you know, very in increased cardiovascular risk. And when you think about um, the same risk associated with um, LDL receptor mutations, you see a very similar risk associated with APOA5 variants. So it's, it's, I think it's one of the uh, forgotten you know, variants or genetic polymorphisms that, that lead to both lipid disorders and high cardiovascular risk. And so I, 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 I want to kind of emphasize that for you as lipidologist clinicians that... Um, LDL receptors or mutations are well known and lead to high LDL and cardiovascular risk. But APOA5 variants are, are if, if not more common, equally common and lead to very high cardiovascular risk of a very similar magnitude. So now I want to move on to another case that falls into the LPL related pathway, but a very interesting kind of added factor that, that made this, this, this patient uh, particularly susceptible to cardiovascular disease. When you think about phimocolomicronemic syndrome, you think about pancreatitis, and you don't necessarily think about premature atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So this is an example of a, of a woman, young woman who has both. She has LPL deficiency, history of pancreatitis. She's known about this since she was a very young girl, actually, originally diagnosed by, by uh, Brunzel at, in Seattle, a very well-known researcher in uh, lipoprotein lipase metabolism. She also had a, a coronary artery bypass surgery at age 54, and she um, she lost some weight. She continues to lose weight because she's on a very, very aggressive, low-fat, low-carb diet. And what's interesting about her is her mother had coronary artery disease, uh, and she has three siblings with high triglycerides, but no, no pancreatitis or heart disease. She has very significant statin tolerance, and she's able to tolerate, though, Potavastatin one milligram per day. So referred to me, and I'm giving her labs here. Her total cholesterol is 112, triglycerides are 1,478, HDL is 
quite low, 14, and LDL is not calculated. But her ApoB was measured by her referring doctor, and her ApoB is actually around 100 milligrams per deciliter. So a relatively high ApoB for somebody who's on a, um, a statin therapy, and, and, and also in conjunction with all the typical things that you would use, the fibrates, uh, omega-3s, and she still has refractory hypertriglyceridemia. So when we did her um, genetic analysis, we found that she's homozygous for LPL deficiency. So she has FCS, uh, you know, classic FCS that you would think about, the female chronic anemic syndrome, type one hyperlipidemia. Uh, but she also is homozygous for an ApoB um, variant. And she also has the, uh, the SOC01B1, the Slocum 1B1 that has been linked to you know, statin-induced myopathy, especially with statins like simvastatin or lovastatin. Um, but um, what's interesting here is that, you know, based on this genomic analysis, I just saw her, so this is, I haven't had a chance to really um, see the impact of this, but we're now going to put her on evolocumab or patha in the hopes that she's already maxed out on her other drugs, including what statin she can tolerate. But we believe that by, by increasing elder receptor upregulation even further, we can you know, clear more ApoB uh, from her plasma, and that would result in a, um, hopefully an improvement, not just in her triglycerides, but her ApoB levels, which we, we think are linked not just to her pancreatitis risk, but also to her very, very premature atherosclerotic risk. So here is an example where we, we found the LPL uh, homozygosity uh, which we could have predicted from her history and her previous analyses that were done many years ago. But here, here using this advanced testing, we're able to find an, a, a homozygote ApoB polymorphism that we think can be better managed with more aggressive LDR, LDR receptor upregulation with, um, with evolocumab. I just want to um, slide a little bit out of order, but I just want to emphasize this point again that the A5 mutants mutations are, have the same risk as LDL receptor mutations. And, and animal models also validate, you know, the knockout, knock-in models for increasing atherosclerotic risk. So that, that's our second case. Now I'll move to case number three. Uh, this is a, um, a middle-aged male, very strong family history of premature heart disease. In fact, his brother, younger than him, uh, uh, had coronary artery bypass surgery. You know, he came in uh, with no, no clinical heart disease, but a very high coronary artery calcium score. But the other thing, he was very uh, sensitive to statins. He, tried, he had tried statins and developed intolerable muscle symptoms. We were able to get him on a five milligram dose of resuvastatin uh, and then uh, added azetamide. Uh, and then on top of that, he, we, we now have his uh, LDL and able to be under better control. But what's interesting about him was uh, this prominent uh, xanthelasmas uh, that we found, and they actually had them surgically removed and they came back. And so when you, when you further looked at his lipid profile, let's go back, his, his HDL is, is, is quite elevated. It's uh, 88 milligrams, I'm sorry, it's uh, 92 milligrams per deciliter. And this is a, a relatively, I wouldn't say he's not an aggressive exerciser. So there's, so he's got a very high HDL. You can see his LD on HDL are rel relatively the same now prior to more aggressive intervention. So Xanthalaz, so we did his genetic testing. Yes, he does have an ApoB um, uh, SNV, uh, but he also is a uh, homozygous for the uh, SCAR, this, this SRB1 uh, uh, receptor. He's homozygote for that, which leads to, as I'll show you, a you know, very high HDL. And this is one of the, uh, it's one of the um, genetic causes of high HDL associated with increased cardiovascular risk. He also, just as a note, he has the Slocum 1B1 mutation associated with more and more statin-induced myopathy. So this is uh, where genomics helped explain, you know, both the high LDL, but also the high HDL. And, and, and associated cardiovascular risk potentially. So to get to, get to the SRB1 mutation, so SRB1 is the receptor that clears uh, HDL you know, from the plasma. So uh, when you have a, a polymorphism of this receptor, you have reduced clearance of HDL and HDL levels increase. 
Uh, but this HDL is not protective. In fact, it might increase cardiovascular risk. So when you look at the type of HDL that you see, you, you'll, you're going to find larger HDL particles in these patients. And so this is just to show you the, the way we define HDL, but you're going to have much more uh, higher levels of HDL. So when we did an HDL map on this patient with using the Boston Heart Lab, it might be a little bit hard to read, but this one I'm showing you here is that the HDL increase was driven by the alpha one and alpha two subfractions of HDL, which are which are the larger HDL particles. So uh, the, again, his his genetic testing was quite helpful, not not only identifying an ApoB polymorphism causing higher LDL, but a, dis, a, a very high HDL, which is not protective and may may increase cardiovascular risk. And I think the xanthelasmus is consistent with that. Uh, Xanthelas most most HDL that we have is, is a lot of HDL, let's put it this way, is, is, is involved in, in skin cholesterol metabolism. And so not surprising, you know, he has xanthelasmas as, as a hallmark feature of the, uh, the, the, the very high HDL in, in, in SRB mutation. So that's, that's an example of, of how HDL elevation uh, may or may not be protective and using genomics can help identify a variant that was associated with increased cardiovascular risk. Now I want to move on and talk about the, the APOE variants of dyslipidemia. And, and there are numerous of these variants of, affecting APOE. I want to focus, of course, primarily on the, uh, the APOE2 variant, which uh, leads to reduced LDL receptor, LDL APOBE receptor clearance of, of, uh, of particles. What's, what's, what's fascinating about this is that APOE2 in general, is a longevity gene. Uh, people that are E2, E2 live longer. Even one E2, you live longer, and you're protected against um, Alzheimer's risk. Uh, however, um, what happens to cause dyslipidemia is what we consider a second hit phenomena. So let me go through a, a case with you that highlights this phenomenon. So this is a 44-year-old male with very severe peripheral arterial disease, not non-smoker, status post-aortic femoral bypass, He's on Jim Brazil, was on a Torvastatin, but developed intolerable muscle symptoms. So you see from his labs, his LDL is 198. His triglycerides are 346. So his total cholesterol is 354. His triglycerides are 344. And so he has that, that tip off of being a type three, you know, familial dyspnea like proneemia. He has both a very high total cholesterol and a high LDL. And they kind of match each other, you know, okay, the typical would be the 400 total cholesterol, 400 triglycerides, would be a good example of a, of a type three. He also, kind of another clue is that is a low ApoB, well, I'm sorry, he has a low ApoB relatively speaking. So an LDL 198, you'd expect an ApoB of 150 or greater, his ApoB is 93. So it, it, it's, it's classic, you know, lipid profile pattern of someone with, um, with a type three hyperlipidemia. And sure enough, he's got the, you know, he's got the, the tubero eruptive xanthomas on his elbow. And, um, and, and we did the genomic testing. Sure enough, he is a homozygote uh, for ApoE2. And so what, what triggered, instead of being a, a, a low lipid levels and longevity and, and let low risk for Alzheimer's, you know, what triggered the, um, the second hit in this case? And so in, in his situation, he has you know, two culprits here, maybe three or four, but he's got ABCA6, which is a relatively rare variant, but in the Dutch lipid clinic registry, this was causing high LDL, roughly equivalent to an, a, a, an FH LDL receptor mutation. He also has an ApoB uh, polymorphism. Uh, 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 and so these are, again, probably good second hits he's, that could lead to a... Um, a uh, uh, much more pronounced dyslipidemia in the presence of being a homozygous for uh, ApoE2. So what was nice about this patient is, again, understanding uh, kind of the mechanisms. We started on a statin, again, he had a lot of trouble with statins, so we, we got with low doses, but with, with his bad peripheral vascular disease uh, and his um, uh, uh, type three dyslipidemia, he responded somewhat to a five low dose statin, but then we added evolocumab, we got a really nice result because these, 
these patients do respond very well to upregulating LDL receptors. Whatever, so that the, 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 the APOE2 on their lipoproteins is taken up less by receptors, but you get more receptors on board, these patients can respond very well to that, that type of approach. And he did respond very well with a LDL going down to 65 uh, and uh, improvement of overall lipids and so forth with, with that combination of treatment. So another uh, you know, good example where genomics was helpful in identifying you know, what could be uh, a, a proper, appropriate therapeutic approach uh, for this patient. So the next one I want to provide is a little bit different. It, it, it's can, demonstrating you know, how, how the type 3 you know, phenotype can, can be quite different in some patients. So this is a 48-year-old female, history of recent pancreatitis, pretty severe episode. She was hospitalized for 14 days, and she did have a previous episode as well, known to have severe hypertroglycerodemia since she was a young, young woman. And she's on max drugs at phenofibrate, Vasipa, Resuvastatin, metformin, insulin, and still her triglycerides that we measured were over, over 7,000, uh, total cholesterol 862, you know, you know, very severe. And, and, and I, you know, uh, some of it could be due to the fact that we did not yet have her A1C well controlled, but, but it was an uh, uh, example of just refractory hypertriglyceridemia with multiple episodes of pancreatitis. When we did her, when we did her blood, it, it, you know, it looks you know, horrible. You know, the, the, the chylomicrons raised to the surface. And so again, I, I, I believe we're dealing with, you know, the phenotypic FCS, you know, phenylchylomicronic syndrome. It, it could be, you know, the classic LPL or APOC2, APOI5, you know, homozygosity that, that we, we, we've seen before. But so it looked like a classic FCS type phenotype at least. But surprisingly so, she, she did have one LPL, uh, heterozygous for LPL, but she also was E2, E2. She was homozygous for E2. Uh, and so she, um, you know, she represents that the first, one of my very few type three patients that really present with a you know, severe pancreatitis type pattern. Uh, and then now she's undergoing, um, uh, we, we're still going through plasmapheresis on a, She's basically plasmaresis dependent now, getting, getting that to keep her triglycerides down below the threshold. No, no further episodes of pancreatitis, but it's been, been a tough road to hoe for someone to have, need to get paresis really every one to two weeks, uh, which the residual effects of that and infections and the catheter and all that has not been easy, but we have an approach for her. Now, the other thing that she has is that she's also homozygous for an B variant and she also has as a um, as a gain of function CTP variant, which I think could be also aggravating her um, her severe dyslipidemia. So let me let me talk about the CTP gain of function variant uh, as a, as an example. So we think about CTP loss of function, you know, the CTP inhibitors, uh, that and there's genomic validation that that when you look at CTP loss of function, they get they get higher HDL, which is thought to be the protective factor, but with the CTP inhibitors. But now we know from much more extensive genomic Mendelian randomization data, it's the LDL lowering effects of CTP inhibition that results in a cardiovascular benefit. Uh, and the more we lower uh, LDL by CTP loss of function, the lower the cardiovascular risk. So it's directly linked to the LDL lowering aspects of, of CTP loss of function. These are relatively common polymorphisms of CTP that lead to lower LDL and lower cardiovascular risk. It's one of the longevity genes also to have loss of function CTP. On the other hand, gain of function CTP is associated with, with high, um, higher LDL and, and, and low HDL, of course, and also much higher cardiovascular risk. So I think that altogether, when you add everything up with their APOE2 high homozygosity and uh, APOB and CTP gain of function, uh, we, see, we see why she's so refractory to existing therapy for, for affecting her LDL, the triglyceride lowering, but also she probably has a very severe cardiovascular risk as well, uh, which, uh, which is something that we, we need to, to maximize the therapy approaches for that as, to get her CV risk to be as low as, as low as well as her pancreatitis risk. 
So those are examples where uh, we look at the LPL pathways and the HDL pathways and how to think about those for um, using genomic testing to better define both risk and, and therapeutic approaches. Now I want to shift to the LDL receptor mutations and the, and the different varieties of those and, and look at you know, both the phenotype and, and the genotype and how more extensive genomic testing can, can really unlock a lot of, of understanding about why this particular patient uh, has the LDL levels that they have and, and what therapeutic approaches we could consider uh, and, and what, how that may manifest itself in, in higher lifetime and cardiovascular risk. So you think about the spectrum of, you know, the homozygote FH, the compound heterozygote, the, uh, the standard LDL receptors can, can range from the null to the defective, and you have other, you have PCSK9 gain of function, and um, uh, again, APO, APOB polymorphisms. Then you have <coughs> the common hypercholesterolemia can look phenotypically like FH, but it's due to many uh, polymorphisms associated with uh, higher levels of LDL. So I just want to give you one case that, that, um, that we had that, that I think was helpful in getting genomic testing because it led to a, a novel approach that we could utilize. So the, I'm sorry about the labs being so, just taking snapshots of these things, but she came in a number of years ago, L, total cholesterol on, on best she could take therapy at the time, you know, 417 total cholesterol, LDL 341, uh, and, um, and then we tried to do all we can with maximizing her drugs, and we, and we got her LDL down, even on uh, PCSK9 inhibitors, down to 298 LDL cholesterol. So uh, this doesn't show it very well, but she had very prominent um, tendon xanthomas on the hands and the Achilles heel. So very, very, um, you know, very prominent tendon xanthomas. So we... Um, did um, genomic testing, and she has you know one one she's heterozygous for an LDL receptor mutation, um, but but she also has an ApoB kind of rare variant that leads to um, you know potentially higher LDL levels. And obviously for her for her phenotype, she's got more like a compound heterozygote and refractory to therapy. And after a significant number of appeals to uh, the insurance companies. Be able to convince them that she's truly a compound heterozygote. After our, I think our third round of appeal, we were able to put her on Evkiza, and she has responded well to that. And so she she now is under much better control. And we were able to use the, the genomic the advanced testing to highlight that as a as a as a compound heterozygote, where she's really really can get uh, another option, uh, rare or orphan therapy that we could utilize to better reduce her markedly elevated LDL levels. So um, that's, that's where the genomics has helped. I just wanna go over a couple other cases similar to this. This is another uh, young man who had premature heart disease, you know, stat intolerance, even on, you know, kind of modest stat doses that he could tolerate, his LDL was still, you know, 300, over 300 milligrams per deciliter. And so when we did his uh, genomic testing, yes, we did find, in fact, that he had LDL receptor, as well as an ApoB, you know, polymorphism, and also had the statin-related um, metabolism issue, one, one being CoQ10 polymorphism, uh, and, um, and that's linked to statin-induced myopathy, as well as the slocum, you know, the statin-induced myopathy polymorphism as well. So those are, those are, it also was ApoE4, which I think is linked, in my experience, this, I think the literature supports this, that when you do have LDL receptor mutations and your E4, you, you, you tend to have higher LDL levels. So he had you know, two other polymorphisms associated with you know, higher LDL levels that gave him a phenotype you know, more consistent with a compound heterozygote or homozygote FH, but also genetic linkages to why he was intolerant to statins. So what we were able to do was we were able to get him on a higher dose of resuvastatin with CoQ10. He's tolerating it well. And uh, evolocumab is now, you know, brought his LDL down to um, a very, very acceptable range, 53 milligrams per deciliter. So very responsive to the therapy once we could understand better his genetic profile. 
Now his daughter, uh, this has got a number of children. Uh, she, she also has, you know, her father looks like her father almost exactly when it comes to the LDL levels, LDL level 375, uh, sorry, total cholesterol 375, LDL over 300. And then um, what's different about her though, she, she's responded well to statins and um, she has the same receptor mutation, the same ApoB, ApoE4 also, does not carry the Slocum B1 or the CoQ10 polymorphism. So she's actually had no, no issues with, with statin therapy. So it's kind of nice to see that we, you know, I, I think there's some controversy about what, you know, how much these genetic factors do influence statin, statin tolerance. But I think this is a good example where the father having them had, you know, very, I think very, um, in my opinion, looking, hearing the history, you know, very credible, you know, statin induced muscle symptoms. And his, his daughter does not, and does not have the the same genetic profile when it comes to those, those specific polymorphisms. So case number nine, and we'll do two more cases, then we'll open up for questions. Another case of familial hypercholesterolemia, refractory, LDL um, 142, uh, but unresponsive to uh, evolocumab. She's on a torvastatin 80, azetamide 10, niacin, high doses. Epidogic acid also was not effective and she cannot tolerate well call. So she's had LDL apheresis for a, a number of years, but um, unfortunately uh, just had her second bypass operation in her 40s. She's, she had her first MI at age 40. As you can see here, she's got this uh, um, LDL of still 130 despite all the drugs we, we were, we've got her on uh, and um, a, very, a very low HDL cholesterol. So um, when we look at her, um, her polyorganic profile, she's homozygote FH. So she's got LDL receptor, homozygos, from hypercholesterolemia. Uh, but she also has um, a, um, uh, an ABC G5 mutation. So she did respond well to azetamide. And she, but she, she also has a, multiple ApoB mutations. They think compound her, um, her factors. And she does have the FADS one, which is more linked to um, to potential risk of, of NAFL, then she, she does have elevated liver enzymes, which I think is linked to this polymorphism. <clears throat> so um, in this case, uh, we confirmed that, you know, she has HOFH, which she wasn't certain she had that, but it turns out her, her parents are second cousins. So, so that kind of fits the, the kind of the family history, but she has other factors that you know, it gave her a much more severe phenotype. So she was starting to have keys also and has, and has done relatively well. So we get examples of where, uh, you know, one kind of compound heterozygote, phenotypic homozygote was able to get Epkiza covered by the genetic testing. And then we have a, a true homozygote with very premature heart disease. They both had premature heart disease, by the way. And uh, in, this, in this case, um, you know, more, you know, more um, classic homozygote FH, of course, but, but also genetic factors that could lead to, um, to uh, uh, more difficult to treat patients. So this is um, uh, a, a young woman who came to see me recently who has a history of having familial hypercholesterolemia and has been on statins for more than 10 years. And then she stopped taking her statin and, and would prefer to stay off statins. Uh, and but her LDL came back at, at 171. But the genetics are actually quite interesting. She does not have an LDL receptor mutation, but she, she does have the uh, ABCG8 and ABCG5 um, polymorphisms, the SNBs. And so she has uh, cytostrolemia and uh, not, not LDL receptor driven um, mutations. And so this was uh, an example where, you know, if we didn't do the more advanced testing, we would may, may not have found out that she's not, not a, a, an LDL receptor or ApoB, uh, but she's really a, a cytostrolemia. And so when we look at, you know, these mutations of ABC, G5 and GA, which are the ones that, that pump out cholesterol from the intestinal cells and, and, and plant sterols, uh, the polymorphism of those result in re reduced, um, uh, removal of the of the plant sterols and, and 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 cholesterol and thereby leads to higher levels in the plasma. Um, so uh, the other interesting thing about this is that stands seem to turn on uh, the uh, or turn really really help increase the uh, absorption of the sterols 
uh, from the intestines and it, is, it results in, in higher beta cetosterol as a marker of absorption. I think is a, a kind of a, a rebound effect or a, a upregulation of, of more absorption when you have statin therapy on board. So we're gonna now treat her with, um, with a zetamide instead of a statin to bring her LDL cholesterol. She's quite happy about that, that difference in, in how we can go about treating her. So, um, so uh, one more case, then I'll, then I'll close out for questions. So 52 year old male hypercholesterolemia, high CAC score, uh, but, um, but, oh, but, but no premature atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, only modest response to atorvastatin, uh, 10 milligrams. So uh, just so he was put on a statin, his LDL went from 168 to 147. So which is again, not a very good response, relatively speaking, lowish HDL cholesterol. So uh, when we looked at his profile, again, he's an ABCG5 polymorphism. He's also got the APOA5 mutations uh, and um, other factors as well. But the one that focusing here is ABCG5 and an APOA5 it explains his, his uh, low response to statins potentially and his low HDL. So when we put him on a, um, a, a ezetimibe, you can see here's the data I showed you before. We put him on ezetimibe, he had a beautiful response. His LDL came down from you know, 137 to 79. So now he's better. You know, I still think we wanted to be more aggressive with him, but an example where the genomics did help identify that ezetimibe could be a, a better option for him because he does have the ABCG5 polymorphism associated with um, reduced, uh, in, you know, inc reduced cholesterol, increased cholesterol absorption by impaired removal of, of cholesterol from the intestines. So in summary, I just wanna um, close out, you know, 20 minutes here for questions that advanced genomic testing helps match the genotype to the phenotype and provide precision therapies to better manage lipid disorders. And then, and then we look at, you know, standard kind of classic LDL receptor, you know, causing female hypercholesterolemia or LPL uh, mutations causing FCS. Other polymorphisms can, can magnify the severity of the phenotype and potentially modify the therapeutic approaches. The examples I gave you was, now we're gonna start using um, evolocumab on a patient with FCS because she has ApoB mutations as well that could, could affect her uh, clearance of ApoB particles. And then same for the, um, the patient who has type three hyperlipidemia, where you can maybe getting better receptor upregulation can make a big difference on their triglyceride abnormalities. And so the other uh, important message is that when you look at triglyceride HDL metabolism, you know, these, these other genes that we can look at, APOA5, SRB1, APOB, and CTP, can help to differentiate you know, among, among the, the different types of high triglyceride, low HDL, which ones you want to be most concerned about when it comes to cardiovascular risk. And then um, as we learn, learn more and more about advanced genomic testing and how we personalize therapy, I, I, I do believe this could become the new standard of care about how we could maximize patients, patient outcomes, especially for the complicated patients that we see in the lipid clinic. So I know I went through quickly and I, I, and I in the slides, I hope you could see them well enough uh, from I did the snapshots of those from our different charts and so forth, but uh, really um, excited to uh, open up for questions. From the from the audience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ison. Um, so we have a few questions. Like I said, if anybody has any questions, just type it into the Q and A box. Um, do you want me to read them, or do you? Uh... Well, let me see if I can see it. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm. Let's see if I got. I can't, I don't see any on my chat box, but maybe you're seeing them. Okay, so here, I'll, I'll, I'll read them out to you, okay? Um, it's from uh, Dr. James Underberg. So he says, Michael, the SCAR-B1 mutations have been associated with high LP little a. Is it your patient that you presented that have, that has a homozygous uh, scavenger or SCAR-B1 mutation? Does your patient have high LPA? Yes, they do, yeah. Okay. That's also true, yes. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah. Um, okay, so going down here. Uh, so here we have from Dr. Tara Dahl. She says, have you used higher doses of Zedia in those with cytosterolemia? She says, I have a, a few patients with ABCG5 and ABCG8 variants. 
you know if insurance will be responsive to use of higher doses of ezetimibe? Yeah, I've tried it. I've done it once on a patient and it, it seemed to make a big difference. Um, yeah, I mean, when we did the original ezetimibe studies way back when, you know, we did a nice, we up went up to, I, I think we went up to 50 milligrams and we didn't see much added benefit to uh, going beyond 10, but, but um, I have done, done it in one patient and um, of course, with being generic now, it's it's not much as much of an issue. But you'd be surprised, as you probably know, Tara, that you know, sometimes these generic drugs are pretty expensive out there. So yeah, I mean, it would it would be more expensive uh, for a patient to take. To I'm not even sure how the insurance companies would even do a pro, an authorization for that. I don't, I don't even know how you explain it to them. But uh, that would be uh, something to consider. I would I would think. And I think it would work for some of those patients that have the. G5 and G8 uh, mutations. Okay, and then um, from Dr. Safarova, Maya Safarova, she writes, the last case that you presented, a patient had a pathogenic variant in the LPA in regards to low, a low stand response. Yes, yep. Okay, that's, so, yeah, uh, so that, that's also true. Yeah, that seems to be an, an interesting, um, you know, phenomenon now with, uh, I think, uh, emerging data showing that patients with high LP little that may manifest as uh, hypercholesterolemia, they may not respond to, uh, to stents. Right, right. I don't, his LP is not that high in this case. It's high, but it's not like sky high where you get these patients that are not responsive to stents at all. Okay, and then... Uh, Dr. Underberg, he writes, so you're putting a lot of weight on variants of undetermined significance. While the findings may match the phenotype, does it, does it concern you that you are making treatment decisions based on findings that have not been validated clinically? So he struggles with this all the time. Yeah, it's, it's a good point, but I think that's where, that's where I think having an understanding about what you're trying to do makes sense. Like, uh, I'll just give you the, the one patient that I just I, one I described to you who had uh, the homozygote for LPL uh, and, um, and premature heart disease, you know, Neil, Neil Stone and I are share that patient and we talked it over and knowing she had the ApoB variant as well, uh, gave us the, the, we want to try evolocumab on her for that reason. So um, like I said, we'll, we'll know more. It's, it, it's, it's really understanding, like you said, the phenotype uh, is, um, is, is, is what we are, are thinking about. But if you understand why, why that phenotype exists, I think we could come up with therapies that might make a difference. Okay. Um, somebody at Dr. Tao asked about major defects of mutated proteins mostly cause protein misfolding. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, about that one, maybe we can get to it uh, a little bit later, unless you have any sort of uh, something to, to respond to that. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Mel, okay. you might know better than I do about which ones are the misfolding protein ones. Then, then um, I mean, there, if you're talking about the LDL receptors, I mean, there, there are definitely variants within the LDL receptors that directly affect the folding of the LDL receptor that gets stuck in the ER. Um, but that, uh, you know, that's, it, it kind of varies, uh, you know, from, from variant to variant. Um, but, but there definitely are, and like I said, within the LDL receptor, they're fairly well characterized, um, more so than, than variants in other genes, for obvious reasons. Um, so another question from Dr. Dahl, she writes, uh, I have found uh, the diabetes, the diabetes genomics to also be helpful. Uh, she said your last patient had an MRI insulin resistance pattern, potentially adding diabetes therapies to Zedia would help to improve the dyslipidemia if he or she also has diabetes high risk genes. She says, are you also using the diabetes genomics? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah we are. Yeah. But that's, that, I, mean, I think, uh, I know you're more aggressive with metformin than, than I am, but I'm starting to get more uh, you know, more thinking about this for those, that, for that reason, when, when we see those high risk, um, diabetes genes. So I think it's, um, it's something that I've gotten more in tune to as well, you know, uh, uh, you know, now with, uh, understanding better about the prevention of diabetes issues that we face a lot with our patients. 
Okay, so a uh, couple more questions um, from uh, Dr. Merriman. He asks, is there a great deal of variability in phenotype severity associated with heterozygous ApoB variants? Yeah, I think, yes, I think that's where, 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 where we have the most, um, I would say that's where we, these variants that have undetermined significance that we don't know how to, how to really weight them is, is, uh, is probably the most challenging right now. But I think, you know, my hope is that as, as more of us get involved in uh, genetic evaluations of patients, we can, we can change uh, all, all these many different variants that we find. We can, we can get better quantification about how uh, pathogenic they are because that's, you know, we're, you know, we're on the front lines of seeing these lipid disorder patients. And I think we can have, a, we can see a variant. We don't know what, what it means necessarily, but if we start getting more and more data, we can then, you know, put more and more weight on specific variants that are more, look, look to be more, but that's what we hope to do with, with our data. Now we have, you know, several hundred patients. Now we can, we can start looking at those, those different ApoB variants and, and, and determine which ones we think are the most most likely to be causing more severe lipid disorders. Okay, I have a couple more here. Um, from uh, Dr. Greenfield, he asks, uh, have genetic determinants, determinants been looked at for patients with, with very high LDLs, but zero calcium scores? So they may not be oxidizing or modifying their LDL particles. Yeah, it's a great question. I think uh, we, I, I would love to learn more about resilient genes hmm. uh, that we could, um, that are protective genes also. We just don't know a lot about protective genes. Uh, and so uh, it, we know of four longevity genes. Uh, one is clotho, which is, don't, we don't exactly know what, why it's protective. Then we have the IL-6, a loss of function. Uh, which is anti-inflammatory, so that's a, you know fits the biology. We have ACE, which is a lower blood pressure in those people, and we have the FOXO3 variant, which is affects lipid met glucose metabolism. So we know we know why uh, we have these four longevity genes, but there, are, there are, I'm sure there are a lot more uh, resilience genes out there that we can um, we can then hopefully understand why certain patients, despite having you know, horrible lipid disorders don't get atherosclerotic disease, uh, but that's that's going to take. Uh, then that, that's what you know. Amanda's always, I'm always asking, him, can you help me find a rare, some rare variant out there? Why this patient doesn't have what they have? And, and he's helping me sometimes trying to find these things, but it's not easy to do that, not to find to find the resilience genes. Okay, and I think this may be our last one from Dr. Peisler. She asks. Have you had any cases of extreme LP little a increase or response to stands? I guess increasing response to stands. And have you tried PCSK9 inhibitors? And do you have any luck with insurance? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I, I don't know specifically about whether um, a certain genetic factors predict increasing levels of LP little a with stands. I, we have a lot of very high LP little a levels. Uh, and and as, you, as you're probably aware, the data from the two studies, Fourier and Odyssey Outcomes, are very convincing that when you have high LPLA and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, uh, the, the persistent inhibitors have a much better absolute risk reduction in those patients. Uh, and so um, we've done, uh, we have used that in our letters to insurance companies, I, I can't tell you how much it's, how often it's been effective, but it is something we do include it. And I, I do in my notes as well. I, I say this patient has ASCVD and elevated LPLA. So I'm going to recommend, you know, evolocumab because in the Fourier trial, I, I just quote the study in the, in the Fourier trial, there was greater absolute risk reduction when they, even, even those that had LDL levels that are relatively well controlled with uh, evolocumab, the, the LPLA elevation made them more uh, likely to benefit from the treatment. Okay, one quick follow-up from uh, Dr. Peisler. She asks, do you test for oxidized phospholipids? And if yes, which, which labs do you use? I don't test for that right now. Um, I think it's uh, it's still, I mean, I do I do believe in uh, Sam Samikas is probably developing the best test. I, I think, I, I'm not sure which labs 
have it yet, but I just not yet convinced there's a good enough test yet to uh, order. I'm not even sure insurance companies cover it yet. So I'm still still learning about this particular test and like to see it you know, be more available. But right now, I, I don't test for it. I think we have one more. Yeah, last one, Dr. Davidson. Um, do you trust the genetic ABCG5 or G8 variants alone to, di to diagnose cytosterolemia, or are you confirming it by serum phytosterols in all cases? I'm not always confirming it, no, because it's hard. Again, it's not, not always easy to get the test. We have we, we can go to, like, I, I that, it's not always available. So I, I, I don't always confirm. I'd like to confirm it if I could, uh, which I often do, but I, I don't always confirm it. I'll use the genetics and put them on a zetamibe common empirically. Well, Dr. Davidson, I wanted to uh, express my deep gratitude for coming on and um, for sharing your insights. And uh, thanks again. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you very much. I hope it was helpful. I, I know I threw a lot of cases at you, but I'm, as you can see, I'm excited about how to use the testing to help manage these complex patients. I know, and I, 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 I know I kind of went at a high level certain complex things, but uh, for those who want to, um, we get get more into the basics sometimes of some of these things. But these are what's fun about lipidology is how how you get you learn a lot by by getting more information and how that information can then ultimately lead to better better treatment for the patients. That'll be the last word. And thanks everybody again. Thanks for attending.